So this is going to be a video response to a relatively recent video uh, that Cosmic Skeptic did on his channel. I've done a video response to him before with respect to objective morality. Um, but this one is, I think, particularly egregious. It's titled, quote, DISGUSTING, in all caps, uh, THINGS FROM MY THEOLOGY DEGREE, unquote. So the title is obviously pretty cringe from the get-go, but um, initially I thought that it was just going to be one of these, you know, typical rundowns of grievances against Christian sexual ethics or something like that. Um, so I was rather surprised, and pleasantly so, when it turned out to be a diatribe against something higher level, as St. Athanasius and St. Anselm's theories on the Incarnation. Unfortunately, this was met with immediate disappointment, as while the subject matter itself is a higher level, um, which is uncommon for internet atheists to even engage with, it became quickly apparent that this guy didn't even try to understand the foundational principles underlying particularly St. Athanasius' uh, theology of the Incarnation and the Atonement. He also butchers St. Anselm, uh, but I really want to focus on uh, St. Athanasius and the horrendous treatment that he got in this video, which I found most offensive. Um, and it's not even particularly offensive to me due to the content which we're going to unpack here, but because of the false pretense of the whole video. It's set up as an atheist really delving into the belly of the beast of sophisticated theology at its best, and exposing it from within as nothing more than pseudo-intellectual nonsense, but he can't even get the theology right on the most basic level, let alone expose it as absurd, which it isn't. So let's dive in here. In his most important essay, entitled On the Incarnation, he writes an extensive defense of precisely why God had to become a human being, why our sins need paying for, and why only a person who is both fully man and fully God could provide this. So then, what does this vital church father think is the basis for this unavoidably sinful state of humankind and need for salvation? Well, Athanasius states very plainly that Jesus died to resolve our state of corruption, itself due to the sinful nature that all humans inherit from Adam and Eve. Jesus came to, quote, settle man's account with death and free him from the primal transgression. This transgression rather obviously being Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge, Forbidden, naturally, since the church considers ignorance to be a virtue. Okay, so we're already off to an abysmal start, and it shows you're already incapable of understanding Christian theology at the most foundational of all levels. The fact that you think that the church regards ignorance to be a virtue proves that you really don't understand anything about the Christian religion at all, let alone atonement theory. You do rightly point out that the reason why, according to St. Athanasius, God became man was to restore our corrupt human nature. But why is human nature corrupt? What is corruption, according to St. Athanasius? St. Athanasius says himself, quote, It would be unseemly that creatures, once made rational and having partaken of the word, the logos, um, should go to ruin and turn again toward non-existence by way of corruption, unquote. So corruption, according to St. Athanasius, follows precisely from man rejecting the rational part of the soul, which, as St. John Damascene says, is the purest part of the soul. And it is by virtue of its rationality that it is made in the image and likeness of the Logos, the image and likeness of God, which is the divine reason and order of the universe through whom all things are made and from whom they derive their intelligibility. Man, having been made in the image and likeness of the Logos, through his rational soul, derives immortal perfection through his participation in the Logos. And once man turns toward irrationality, which is the essence of sin in the order of practical reason, man throws off his participation in the Logos and thereby receives corruptibility because it is his union with the Logos, mankind's union with the Logos, which is the ontological ground of immortality in the first place as a preternatural gift. So far from ignorance being a virtue and the maintenance of ignorance as the aim of Adam and Eve's trial, it's actually the turning toward irrationality, away from the source of right reason, which is the source of corruptibility entering into the world. It is a rejection of God, a rejection of the Logos, the divine reason that imbues intelligibility into the cosmos, which severs man from the gift of immortality and eternal life. So 
What then do we make of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, many church fathers have discussed uh, what the tree was meant to symbolize. Now, we know for a fact that it does not symbolize your simplistically and theologically illiterate theory about God just wanting Adam and Eve to stay stupid and irrational. Now, as I said, many fathers have speculated as to the symbolic nature of the forbidden tree. Many Eastern fathers, for example, say that the tree was not even inherently forbidden, but that its fruit would be available for Adam and Eve once they were properly matured and disposed to receive theosis and deification. Hence, the sin being that central pride which urges to take possession of divinity on their own terms and not on God's terms who truly does want to give them a participation in his divinity, in his divine life, but according to an orderly and structured means of attaining it according to his divine wisdom. Now, w whether that's the right way to interpret what the tree means, one thing is for sure that no father uh, regarded the tree as symbolizing knowledge as such, and none of them regard ignorance as a virtue in any sense, uh, which wouldn't make sense at all given the whole metaphysical scheme of what we've just been establishing. Let's continue. Consider what we're actually being sold here, the unthinkable concept of inheritable sin, inheritable moral responsibility, this of course being the basis for that other kind of superstitious idiocy that is racism. The idea that you can have a moral character and value ingrained in your DNA by virtue of the crimes of your forefathers, which by the way, they never actually even committed. There was no first man, there was no fool, and there is no basis for this concept of original sin. But for how many years has this invention been used to justify the concept that we human beings are in a state not just of mere transgression, but of total corruption? And not only rapists, murderers and the likes, but everyone. Children, from the moment of their birth, well, moment of their conception, there's another Christian sticking point, are in a state of corruption, deserving of unimaginable torture in an infinite series of punishment in hell. I mean, have you ever heard of anything more cruel and disgusting. And thanks to Athanasius, who grounds the entire necessity of Christ in this concept of original sin, it will never be something that Christianity can throw off, let alone apologize for, since he believed that Jesus came precisely to solve this condition of- I think it's important at this stage to clarify a few things about original sin, because it's another casualty of his ignorance of Christian metaphysics. Um, so what is meant by original sin specifically? Well, formally, it refers to the privation or lack of sanctifying grace or original justice in the soul carried on generationally from the sin of our first parents. Now, what are the implications of that privation or lack? Well, to understand what the lack of something means, we have to reflect on the positive nature of what it is that is lacking. That is, sanctifying grace and original justice. These are the means by which the soul is ordered toward union with God by divine elevation. So when those things are removed from the soul, then what's left? Well, of necessity, it's the soul being ordered away from God, away from the Logos, away from union with the divine. Uh, since human nature is finite, it's not able to reach the divine on its own, so it requires uh, divine grace in order to do so. So the state of the soul as being ordered away from God, away from the good, uh, just is what it's meant by the incurred guilt of original sin. It is the state of the soul as hostile or opposed to God as a result of the corruptibility of human nature removed from union with the divine being passed down from Adam's sin, which is what original sin is uh, and what its heritable guilt consists in. More specifically, Athanasius writes that Jesus came to resolve what he calls the divine dilemma. This dilemma is the conflict between two things. On the one hand, God created man with infinite life and happiness in mind, but on the other, he ruled that the price of sin must be death. This means that when Adam and Eve committed the primal sin, God had to stay true to his word and condemn us to that death. The dilemma is that God designed us to achieve eternal life. But he can't go back on his word, so death must be paid nonetheless. But if we die, it's an insult to God's prescience, because he may as well have never created us in the first place. Yet if we don't die, then God would be going back on his word. It's a tough spot. This is why Jesus needed to come in order to pay the price of death on our behalf. 
Being fully man, he could pay man's price of death, and being fully God, he had the power to resurrect himself, restoring eternal life. Ergo, man pays the price of death, yet man also achieves eternal life. The dilemma is solved. And the way Athanasius writes suggests that we should be celebrating the fact that Jesus offers a solution to the dilemma, which, I'll remind you, is a dilemma of God's creation in the first place. I mean, we're expected to be grateful, to show thanks. How could you be so merciful, O Lord, as to offer me a chance to escape your punishment for that crime that not only did I not commit myself, but nobody ever committed, and to offer it through the torture of a pseudo-pacifistic and sexually repressed human being by crucifixion? Thank you for affording us such class and such grace. I really do love how you just had to get that bit in there, uh, mocking Christ as sexually repressed. That's totally not a manifestation of the latent restless, guilty conscience that's still in you somewhere after having left Catholicism. But I guess that's neither here nor there. So you do get this dilemma half right, at least propositionally. It is true that St. Athanasius phrases the dilemma roughly along those lines. He does say, quote, for it were monstrous, firstly, that God, having spoken, should prove false, that when once he had ordained that man, if he transgressed the commandment, should die the death, after the transgression, man should not die, but God's word should be broken. For God would not be true if when he had said we should die, man died not." Unquote. But you completely gloss over the ontologically based reason as to why death is the punishment for man's sin. It's not as if God just arbitrarily decided that death was to be the uh, purely externally imposed penalty. Implicit in this and explicit elsewhere in the work, St. Athanasius guards death as the natural consequence for sin, given the ontological nature of what sin is and what its logical implications are. What is death, according to St. Athanasius? Death is essentially uh, corruptibility. It's the inclination towards non-being, as he makes clear when he says, quote, for if, out of a former normal state of non-existence, they were called into being by the presence of the loving kindness of the word, that is the Logos, it followed naturally, naturally, that when men were bereft of the knowledge of God and were turned back to what is not, for what is evil is not, but what is good is, they should, since they derive their being from God who is, be everlastingly bereft even of being. In other words, that they should be disintegrated and abide in death and corruption." Unquote. So as you can see here, the relationship between a rational creature cutting himself off from the grace of the divine Logos and the corruption of death, which is the farthest extent of evil or privation of being, is not arbitrary at all, nor is it a purely externally imposed punishment. It is a natural consequence. If you cut yourself off from the source of light, there will necessarily be darkness, because darkness just is the lack of light. Put that in existential terms, and you have the basic formula that the light of being, which proceeds forth from God, is the source of the rational creature's immortality. If the rational creature puts himself in opposition to that source of divine light, then he will descend into the logical extension of its opposition, namely non-being, or death. This is the logical consequence of rejecting the divine logos. And God's permission of that consequence being played out is analogically said to be the punishment as a reflection of his justice. Thus, if God by his mercy, and remember St. Athanasius considers the calling out of being from non-being as an act of divine mercy, um, if God by his mercy wishes to prevent this sorry state of affairs for mankind, what is he to do? The answer to this dilemma is not Christ uh, suffering divine punishment, uh, as you seem to imply, but Christ entering into the process of death itself in order to conquer it from within. Because Christ is the Logos, the source of all being, and the source of all life, only the Logos being hypostatically united to a human nature could possibly restore divine life in man by destroying death. And he destroys death precisely by entering into it, precisely by making himself subject to it, not to be the subject of any arbitrary punishment, but to dispel the darkness of non-being by the superabundance of divine life which he possesses by the divine essence with whom he is consubstantial. 
When light enters into darkness, the darkness cannot help but be dispelled by virtue of the very nature of the light. Similarly, the Logos, who is life itself, can only destroy death by entering into it, given his very nature. And it is the power of his incarnation, its ontological nature, which culminates in the resurrection, in which we as the mystical body of Christ, the church, can participate in. Uh, that's the answer to the divine dilemma. And it's something that requires you to familiarize yourself not only with the mere words of the text, but with the philosophical and metaphysical worldview underlying the texts themselves. That means having a solid grasp of ancient cosmology, of ancient metaphysics, of Platonism, of Neoplatonism, of even Aristotelianism, and of patristic biblical exegesis. When you don't do that, well, you end up making videos like this one. So I hope that was uh, helpful and maybe gave you a, a deeper insight into patristic thought on the purpose of Christ's death and resurrection, which is really one of the main reasons why I made this video. Um, so let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, like the video if you enjoyed it. Uh, do subscribe if you haven't. Um, take care. God bless.